Hello everyone and Namaste. In our last session we talked about the illusion or the veil of Maya. We said that generally there is always this awareness of this and that. And this and that is duality. This sense of all these objects which are in the external world, which takes us away from our true, real self. The example given in the Tripura Rahasya is that of a, a rope. In the dark, you imagine that the rope is a snake. And the reason we have this imagination is that we have the fear in us. This coloring is also called badha, or removal of a band. This, this sense of obstacle. And removing this obstacle or vada is actually looking at the rope and realizing it's only a rope. When you see a rope and think it's a snake, that's ignorance. But when you look at the rope and know it to be a rope, that is knowledge. And so, this is the concept behind meditation. Through purification, through a systematic practice, we aim at removing the badhas or the coloring, the kleshas within the mind. The word klesha comes from the Yoga Sutra. The word badha is used here in the Tripura Rahasya, it's used in the Tantric system. As well as colloquially in India, the word badha is used very often as a blockage or an obstacle. We are at chapter 18, verse 136. Not the objects of waking or dreaming, but consciousness alone is the self-existent reality. Then where does duality exist? If you think that external objects are real because they seem to be real and because worldly purposes are accomplished through them, listen. Even the objects of dreams seem to be real during the dreaming state. There is one difference between the experience of the waking and dreaming states. In the waking state, one knows the falsehood of the dreaming state. But in the dreaming state, one does not realize the falsehood of the waking state. With this weak argument, it cannot be concluded that the experiences of the waking state are true. So we all know this. When you get up in the morning, you may recall a dream or two and when you get up and recall that dream, you know it was only a dream. But when you are in the dream, you are not aware that there is something like the waking state. And this is the argument that most people use to say that the waking state is reality and the dreaming state is an illusion. Tripura Rahasya challenges this argument. In verse 140, it says, Are not the objects of a dream useful during the dream, just as material objects are useful during wakefulness? As we experience the steadiness of the objects in the waking state, do we not experience the objects in the dreaming state in exactly the same way. The objects seen in dreams are not real in the waking state and the objects seen in the waking state are not real in the dream state. This similarity is found in both states. If you listen attentively and think, what is the difference between the past events of the waking state and the events of the dreaming state. If the magician creates objects through his illusions, illusionary power, 
Do you think his creation is true? The difference between true and untrue is not known to ordinary people. And because of the attachment to the objects of the world, they say that the objects of the world are true. O Parshunarama, the truth is self-evident and ever-existent. Worldly objects, on the other hand, are transitory and evident only when perceived. The worldly objects are seen differently at different times. But, O Parshurama, contemplate how and where consciousness is absent. When one is aware of Atman or consciousness, then how will he be aware of time? If one is not aware, then how will he be aware of consciousness and time both? Because the awareness in both cases is due to the elimination of pure consciousness. Therefore, O Parshurama, consciousness is all-pervading illumination. That is why it is truth. What is truth and what is untruth? Let me briefly explain. So far... The thinking goes that the waking and dreaming states are both illusions for the simple reason that during the dream state, if you lose a loved one, let's assume you lose a child, you feel also a terrible pain, just as you would feel when you would lose your child in the waking state. If you have been abandoned by your partner in the dream state. You feel a terrible pain. If you have such a dream, also you will feel that kind of pain. So how can we distinguish between the two? In the waking state, we believe this to be reality. But in the dream state also, you believe this to be reality. And all your actions, emotions, fear, attachment, desire, all is just as real as it is in the waking state. So it is practically impossible to distinguish between the two. So Dattatreya asks, Rhetorical question, what is truth and what is untruth? In verse 149, that which does not depend on anything for its illumination is truth. In other words, it is untrue exactly like the snake in the rope is untrue. Contradictory statements can prove the validity of self-existent reality. Contradiction itself is proof of invalidity. Verbal denial is mental admission. In a way, contradiction leads nowhere and does not furnish any proof. So truth or certain things are self-evident. We all know that there is a sun in the sky and it provides us with light. And somebody can keep telling you that's not the sun, that's a big light, it's, a, it's been put there by aliens. But you know it, it's self-evident, it is clear, there is, there is no other truth to that and you know it and everybody knows it. So this is a truth. So anything that's self-evident is true. If you look at your surroundings and you see a chair, you know it is a chair. It's a self-evident, it's a truth. Or you see a dog. But when you see the dog, you get scared because you think the dog is a monster. Why? Because you were bitten by a dog. Well, that's not true because you have added something to it. And so the coloring that you've added to it that takes it away from the truth. But when you saw the chair, you didn't have any such coloring. It was just an ordinary chair. There's no coloring to it. So, the dog which you have turned into a monster in your mind is untruth, is ignorance. 
the chair, which is simply a chair, is a form of truth, which is self-evident. Verse 151 Therefore, that which is self-evident, unconditioned and the very foundation of all experience is real. Anything other than this is unreal. What is the very foundation of all experience? Everything that we experience in life, we understand through a frame of reference. We go through life from childhood, become children, go to school, we become teenagers, the body changes, our thinking changes. Those toys that you liked as a child, you don't want to be seen with as a teenager. Your body has changed completely. You don't look anything really like that child. If somebody has not seen a six-year-old at the age of 16, he may not be able to recognize that same child. It's now 16 years old. So much is the difference. The same 16-year-old becomes 26 and is now a young adult and may look similar to what he or she was at the age of 16. But mentally, there has been a great deal of growth and greater maturity. The body changes again. When at the age of 36, the body is much more mature, so is the mind, the behavior is far more mature. You cannot really compare that with the maturity or the mind frame of a six-year-old. But all the same, the six-year-old you and the 36-year-old you, something was the same. That something is who you are. That is the self. That's the foundation. Everything else around it keeps changing. The body keeps changing. The mind keeps changing. The emotions keep changing. Experiences keep changing. But something remains the same. And that is the very foundation of all experience. And everything else is unreal. Verse 152 Unless there is self-conscious, self-existent reality, nothing can be experienced. Even the notion it is nothing cannot be experienced without consciousness. Therefore, a logician who claims that consciousness is not the source of illumination is like a man who does not admit his own existence. If he tries to prove he does not exist, what is the source of denial? How can a person who, because of lack of self-realization, doubts his own existence, still claim to remove the ignorance of others? So this here, again, is another verse aimed at the school of Shunyavada. Shunyavada, as I have mentioned before, is the school of the void. There's a void and those that school expanded, grew, became very intellectual and became very popular, especially among those who are intellectual or highly educated. And it has gone on to become a world religion and it is called Buddhism. In the early days, around 800 I would say even before um, 400 AD to 800 AD, there were a lot of discussions, debates, arguments between those from the school of Shunyavada and the other schools which were part of Sanatana Dharma before the school became a world religion. It talked about the void and it said there is nothing. There's nothing. There's no God, there's nothing. This is there's a void. And they use logical thinking to argue and to defeat people in debates. 
And so, basically, when you say there is nothing, who is the one who is perceiving nothing? There has to be somebody who perceives nothingness. So if you do not exist, how do you know that there is nothing? So this kind of argumentation was is senseless. How can you say that there is nothing? There has to be some foundation which experiences nothingness. And this is exactly the experience we go through in a state of yoga nidra when you are fully aware in deep sleep. There is nothing there but you know and you experience that nothingness and the one who experiences the nothingness is the self. Verse 154 Even though his logic may be sound and his words flowery, he cannot lead others towards self-realization because his knowledge is based on logic. The knowledge which we use in our daily life is unable to prove its validity. Doubtless, this so-called knowledge is deluding. Therefore, it should be considered to be only an illusion, as any illusion, unless clarified, is taken as truth. Similarly, in the waking state, all experiences seem to be valid. So, it clarifies here that those who base their arguments on logic and insist that the waking state is the only reality, well... That's, that's an illusion, but if you are, do not have the awareness to examine this illusion, then yes, you will consider this waking state to be a valid reality. It's like saying that the magician's illusion was not an illusion, it really happened. So the magician cut up a woman into two parts. A wonderful illusionary trick that a lot of magicians perform and then they bring the woman to life again by joining her parts. So was the woman really cut apart? No. We all know that somewhere that it's, it's a great illusion, it's a wonderful illusion, we don't believe it. But imagine that you would be foolish enough to believe it. Well, that is exactly what happens with most of us because we get so lost in this wonderful illusion that we are living in, that we take this to be the reality. Verse 158. When one has profound knowledge of Mother of Pearl, he does not get deluded by mistaking it for a piece of silver. Similarly, the knowledge of the Atman dispels all other illusions. As everyone thinks the sky is blue, though it is not, similarly, because of ignorance, the experience of waking state is illusory. Complete freedom from illusion is pure knowledge, and that is the real existence of Atman. Here, the example of Mother of Pearl is used. For those who don't know what Mother of Pearl is, it is a nice kind of silvery kind of object, very shiny, and you might mistake it for silver. But those who have knowledge of it, they feel it, and from the feeling of it, they know this is not silver, because a metal metallic feeling of silver is different. Just as many people look at the sky and they say, oh, it's blue, yes, the sky is blue, but you know when you have studied a little bit in school, you paid attention that it appears blue, but in fact it is all air and they, it has no color, but it just appears blue and that's an illusion. And so those who do not have this knowledge, they think the sky is blue or they think that the mother of pearl is silver 
or you think that the waking state is this reality. Freedom from this illusion is pure knowledge. Verse 160 O Parshurama, I have replied your questions decisively. Remove your doubt in this regard, decide firmly and follow it. You have previously asked me how liberation is attained. Now here is the answer. Listen to me attentively. In the world there are three kinds of great liberated beings. Those who constantly remain disgusted with the things of the world every moment, yet are self-realized, are the third category. So it doesn't begin from the first category, it begins from the third category. He's a liberated being, but he still has a sense of aversion in him. That's why he's of the third category. Because while he remains established in the self, he remains disgusted with the things of the world. The second category are those who reap the fruits of actions performed in previous lives and remain in the state of Samadhi. So, second category is when the fruits of previous actions will be, have to be reaped or, or have to be lived out. And these also live in and remain in the state of Samadhi. This is the second category. And finally, those who have reaped the f those who have reaped the fruit of their actions from previous lives and were never trapped by the charms of the world remain undisturbed in all circumstances. So the first category is those who have already reaped the fruit of the actions. There's no nothing more to, to live out, and so they do not, they are not trapped by the charms of the world. They remain undisturbed. They have neither aversion nor do they still need to live out anything. They are firmly established in the self. Their temper remains even in all events of life. From within, their state of mind remains tranquil. They are the best of all. In this way, having different faculties of discrimination, the liberated ones are of different types and their behavior differs according to their inner nature. So, we see that not all liberated beings are similar or the same. They don't start looking like little robots, all of them, or, you know, looking the same, performing the same action, having the same reactions to everything. They are different. And this, of course, are the three categories. You can see very clearly that category three was the lowest and category one was the highest category. Thus ends chapter 18 with a dialogue on gaining knowledge between King Janaka and Ashtabhaka. So, we move on to chapter 19. Chapter 19 is the dialogue between the great seer Dattatraya and the sage Parshurama on the various states of the realized one. Hearing from sage Dattatraya, Sri Parashurama started asking questions regarding the liberated ones and their behavior. This is of course a very interesting topic because we have this idea generally that once one is liberated, somehow everybody is the same. Most of us don't know what liberation means. We use the word enlightenment very carelessly, 
The Yoga Sutras, for example, defines very clearly the different stages of Samadhi, with seed, without seed, and explains exactly what liberation means. But mostly, we use this word in a colloquial sense, and we are not very sure what it exactly means. Here, Sri Parshurama, being a very dedicated and curious student, wants to know all these things and asks the sage, Dattatraya, teacher of teachers, to explain him the detailed differences between the liberated ones. In verse 2, he says, Lord, kindly explain to me systematically, with full details, why differences are seen among the liberated ones. It is true that all liberated ones have knowledge of the self equally, and because of that knowledge, the goal of all is liberation. How can there be differences if the faculty of discrimination differs? Are there different ways of realizing the self? Please tell me everything. The compassionate Dattatreya started explaining thoroughly. Listen, Parshurama, I am revealing the highest secret to you. The means of attaining knowledge are not different. One reaps the fruits according to the way he does sadhana. The end of sadhana is the attainment of knowledge. If sadhana is not completed, more effort is needed. Consciousness is knowledge and is self-illuminated. For that self-existent knowledge, illumination, no sadhana is necessary. The self-illuminated Atman is preserved within and is crystal clear by nature. What sadhana is needed for that which is self-illuminated and self-existent? It is preserved within chitta, like a brilliant gem that is veiled by a deep layer of death and hence remains unseen. One can see it with a one-pointed mind. Then alone can one realize its full brilliance. Sadhana dispels all the desires which create barriers. In some it is noticed that desires have diminished and it is noticed that buddhi is sharpened. There are many categories of intellect. O Parshurama, the degree of sadhana, effort, the sadhaka needs to make is according to the degree of ignorance which has veiled consciousness. So this is a very interesting comment. It says, consciousness is self-illuminated, no sadhana is necessary. It's like a gem. It's crystal clear. But it is buried in a deep layer of dirt and is not seen. So we do not need sadhana in order for that brilliant gem of consciousness to shine. We need sadhana to remove these layers of dirt which is obscuring our vision. We cannot see it. You need a one-pointed mind. So, the sadhana is training your mind to make it one-pointed by removing the barriers. So the degree of effort or sadhana is needed and how much sadhana is needed, how long, what kind of sadhana is needed is determined by the degree of ignorance. Those who are extremely ignorant, the word ignorant sounds judgmental but it means impurity of mind. Badhas was the word used or from the Yoga Sutras, Kleshas. The colouring, our misunderstanding, our lack of perceiving the world as it is. And to purify the mind, we need sadhana. And so, 
how much sadhana, what kind of sadhana, depends on your level of knowledge or your level of ignorance, which is very often why you need a, a good teacher. A student may say, yes, I want to do sadhana, and he looks at books, he looks at scriptures, looks at websites, videos, and then he comes up with some kind of sadhana. Can such a sadhana be helpful? Can such a sadhana be useful and help purify and train the mind? You need a teacher who is able to see you clearly and assess your level of knowledge. Such a teacher can also see what is most suited to you according to your nature, according to your phase of life. And accordingly, such a teacher would guide you. Unfortunately, in modern times, most people do not want to take guidance of a teacher because they feel that they can just look at videos and websites and read books and gather enough techniques from there and manage. And it is possible that you manage if that's what you want, just to manage, <laughs> then that's totally fine. But if you really want to remove these obstacles, bathas, and to really evolve into a happier, healthier human being and eventually attain liberation from all suffering, then it would be very useful and good to have a experienced teacher. Verse 16 of chapter 19. There are three main injurious impure desires. Aparad vasana, karma vasana and kama vasana. Not having faith in the Vedas and scriptures is called Aparad Vasana. <clears throat> and to have doubt in the existence of the self is also called Aparad Vasana. Those who are skilled in different arts and have the opportunity to be in the company of a sage and to study the scriptures still do not attain that knowledge beyond. They believe that no such thing as higher knowledge exists. And even if it does exist, no one can attain it. If one has known it, he starts doubting it. So how can a doubtful knowledge become the means for liberation? In this way, self-conflicting delusions create, doubts create delusion. So, in fact, aparad vasana is nothing other than the doubting mind. These imprints in the mind, which are very deep, always are doubting you. Have you heard a voice in you which says, oh, you can't do this, you're not good enough, you will not manage, don't bother, don't waste your time. This is a Bharadvasana. You doubt the scriptures. You read it and say, oh, is this true? You listen to your teacher and you doubt the words of your teacher. Oh, can this be true? So you may even have had a little glimpse but then you say, no, maybe I was just imagining, fantasizing. Maybe I'm not worthy enough for this. These are doubts. So even though you may be skilled, you may even live in the company of a stage, you may have studied scriptures, but you still will not attain this knowledge. And maybe you begin to have these thoughts that such a thing doesn't exist. It's a waste of time. Let me not waste my time. Let me enjoy my life. These kind of doubts. How can such a doubting mind attain liberation? Because doubtful knowledge cannot be means of liberation. This will only create more conflicts within you. Because this is called a Vasana.
Vasana, the word vasana actually means deep impression, very ancient impression. It means the same as samskara, but vasana is much deeper and far more ancient from previous lives. So this first kind of vasana is called self-created illusion. Suffering from such ignorance, hundreds of thousands of people are caught in this whirlpool. Impurity of intellect caused by previous samskaras is called karma, samsvasana. Creates barriers in understanding the teachings imparted by the master. These strong barriers cannot be removed by merely controlling the mind and its modifications. The third one is impure desire or karma vasana is even more injurious and it is kartavya yasesa, the false sense that this is my duty. This has many ramifications. This is my duty. The desire to fulfill one's duty is called Kama Vasana. Om Parshurama. Someone might count the waves of the ocean, others count the atoms of the universe, yet others count the stars. But it is impossible to count the countless desires of the human being. This third category of impurity is the desire to enjoy. So one aspect is the aspect of karma, where you feel that there are duties and you have to perform, you have to do things. And these spring out of desire, in fact. And that's the desire to enjoy. And there are countless stars and you can still count the stars, but you cannot count the countless desires that human beings have. When one is fulfilled, then the next one rises. When this one is fulfilled, the third one arises. And this keeps us going continuously, lost in this whirlpool of samskara. O Parshurama, this desire is filled with expectation. It is vaster than the sky and as immovable as the mountains. Because of this selfish desire, the whole world seems to be crazy. The whole world goes through pain as if it has been burnt by fire. Those fortunate ones who have attained perfect vairagya are liberated while living in the world. They remain calm and tranquil. The mind is afflicted by these three kinds of desires. That is why Supreme Consciousness does not shine forth. So, in spite of people who are practicing, who are blessed with the knowledge of scriptures, who may even have the company of a teacher, still are not attaining because of these three desires. One is doubts, second is a false sense of duty, and third is the desire to enjoy the world. The purpose of sadhana is to destroy all pleasure-seeking desires. The first category of desire is caused by lack of firm faith. Freedom from the bondage of karma can be obtained by the grace of God. It is attained in many lifetimes and not through the thousands of means once one applies. Karma vasana, the desire for self-indulgence, can be removed with the help of non-attachment. Non-attachment grows when one becomes indifferent to the objects of enjoyment. There is no other way. So how does one deal with these three vasanas? The very first one was a prad vasana, which was the doubting mind. And to deal with the doubting mind, you need to attain Firm faith by the grace of God. Freedom from bondage of karma is attained in many lifetimes. And 
freedom from karma vasana, the desire for self-indulgence, is only removed with non-attachment, awareness. Verse 34 O Parshurama, these self-inflicted desires have a dual nature, temporary and lasting. According to their strength, efforts are made to gain release. The root cause of various methods of sadhana is the desire for liberation. Without sincere desire for liberation, no matter how much a person listens to a teacher or contemplates, he cannot attain the dis knowledge of self-existent reality. Sermons and accomplishments are mere skills. Mastery in any skill does not lead to the highest goal. Without burning desire for liberation, study and contemplation are useless, like dressing a corpse. O Parshurama, if the desire for liberation is weak, then that desire is in vain. Just as by hearing the name of the fruit, the fruit is not obtained. So, while there are many badhas or obstacles caused by the three bad, uh, by the three basanas, the doubting mind, the sense of false sense of duty, and the desire for worldly objects to enjoy them. Somewhere inside us, we have another desire, a fourth desire. And this desire is really that desire which will free us. So while desires per se are not good, we don't want to have desires, we want to let go of these desires. But the very last desire to be let go of is the desire for liberation. In fact, this is a desire that we want to strengthen. So if you do not have a desire for liberation and somebody tells you, your, your partner, your parents, oh, go and listen to this great teacher or there's a sage or somebody, go and listen. Listening will not help because there is no desire for liberation. So you listen to these kind of things and they are, remain superficial. They do not work the deepest part of your mind. And so, without a burning desire for liberation, all study is useless. It's all intellectual, it's dry knowledge. It's like dressing a corpse. Well, why should we dress a corpse? Useless. So it is with intellectual study. It is useless. After receiving the fruit of an action, desire for the fruit vanishes. Who is that human who does not have the desire to receive the fruits of his action? So momentary desire for liberation, which for some reason arises all of a sudden, does not yield fruits. Intense and continuous one-pointed desire for liberation will be fruitful. That intense desire for liberation inspires one on the path of sadhana. This is called a burning desire. So every now and then we have a momentary desire for liberation. When do we have this? When we are suffering. So your partner leaves you or your parents, one of your parents dies and you feel intense loss, intense pain. You lose your job and you see your children suffering because you're not even able to feed them properly or clothe them well. And this suffering makes you want to have liberation. And in this moment, everybody becomes a philosopher, everybody becomes religious, everybody thinks of God. And such a yogi a person is called Samshan Yogi because you know, he thinks of the graveyard, if somebody dies and you get very philosophical. And 
this is temporary. This is just a momentary thing. It's like you're driving very fast on the highway and you see an accident. The moment you see the accident, you slow down. But for how long? Just for a while. After a while, you forget. And then again, you start driving fast. So it is with these kind of fleeting desire for liberation. And this kind of desire will not lead to results. It's only an intense and continuous one-pointed desire that will be fruitful. Such a burning desire will lead you to liberation. There's a difference between push and pull. When you suffer, you're pushed. You're pushing yourself and the sufferings push you and say, oh, you need to be liberated. But when you have experienced something beautiful and that longing has risen in you, then that longing pulls you. And that's the difference between a push and a pull in liberation, is that the push is temporary. It really is depending on external factors, while the pull is something deep inside. It's, a magnet, it's like magnetism, it's an attraction, it's like gravity. It pulls you closer and closer. Until gravity is so strong, it's like a black hole, you cannot escape from it. You've come too close, you fall into it and you lose your ego. It's lost. You become one with that burning desire and that burning desire for liberation will burn all other desires until you have attained and become one. When all limbs of a man's body are burning with the skin disease, that man desires relief. Similarly, when there is no other desire except the desire for liberation, then that yields the fruits of moksha. Desire other than for moksha is common. So there is only one desire which will free you and that is the desire for liberation. All other desires will bind you. Through non-attachment comes desire for liberation and thus one is inspired to do intense practice. From this comes increased absorption into intensive practice. The more a person is absorbed in practice, the sooner he attains the results. So, we need non-attachment to intensify this desire for liberation. So we need to continue to do some form of sadhana to clear the bhagas, to remove the kleshas, the colorings that prevent us from seeing our true nature, which is like a brilliant gem gem of consciousness. So, it's a good place to stop here at verse 47. Continue next time. And I hope you enjoyed. Until next time.